All right, good afternoon. Does this work? So I was asked to talk about um, a little bit different uh, attack, and it's really uh, putting two of these regenerative medicine companies together. So it was the acquisition of Aldogen by a company called Cytomedics. Um, prior to the acquisition, I was actually the president and COO of Aldogen. So when I go through this talk, um, maybe like Dean did earlier, we're, I, I may talk about us and we and them and uh, get it mixed up, but um, that's the perspective we'll go through. Um, we are a public company, so I need to show this before we go in. And just, you know, I want to put a little bit of background to this. And I told Dean I had this slide for him, um, so I'm glad he hadn't left yet. Um, and this is, you know, the deal is a wonderful thing for regenerative medicine. There's no question about it. Um, the, the price, the return, the, the assets that are going to be put in place. The only problem is that there aren't a lot of $150 million products in regenerative medicine. I mean, that's the problem. And so how do you then, as companies who are trying to develop these therapies in phase one or phase two, how do you fund the companies? And then ultimately, how do you return money to investors who give you the money to do that? Um, Dean, great deal, but you know, we just aren't as lucky as you to have the, that product. So you know, there really aren't many choices here when you think about it. Uh, I think George alluded to this. I mean, trade sales are one, and there haven't been a lot of them in this space, the one that we've talked about already. IPOs in the past have been a, a nice liquidity option, a way of raising money. They're no longer. It's a financing event at best. Um, so what, are there other paths that you can go down? And that's really the one that we're going to talk about today in terms of this acquisition and what it means and how that may be a model for other regenerative medicine cell therapy companies going forward. So just a little bit of history um, on Aldogen, for those who don't know the company. So I'm going to set up the history here and, and uh, where we were from a company perspective and why the acquisition uh, came through in the terms of that. So Aldogen, we were a venture-backed company, uh, raised a significant amount of money through a syndicate of venture capital firms, mainly in the southeast, but these are firms that have you know, over a billion dollars committed. Uh, we were developing cell therapies, uh, autologous cell, cell therapies using a technology we licensed from Duke and Johns Hopkins, uh, sorting a population of uh, stem and progenitor cells using an intracellular marker called ALDH or aldehyde dehydrogenase. We had actually completed studies already in heart failure, and critical limb ischemia, and cord blood uh, transplant enhancement with our technology, so we were fairly advanced in terms of uh, maturity. 20 employees, and uh, in-house we have a, a GMP-compliant manufacturing facility to produce our products, uh, research capabilities of assay development and um, characterization, and then uh, a lot of regulatory uh, quality experience. We've had six INDs clear with our technology. We've gotten an SPA for a phase three study. We've got an orphan drug designation for another product. We've got a 510K product. So a lot of experience, I think, in this field of uh, cell therapy. We actually tried to go public. Um, when I put this slide together, it was it brought back a lot of memories. Uh, some good, some bad. Um, but if you look here again, we, we filed in 08. I'll never forget being in New York. We were in drafting session with our investment bankers, and investment bankers spend one eye on the, what you're talking about, another eye on the Blackberry. That's, if anyone knows investment bankers, that's pretty much how they operate. And uh, we were in the drafting session immediately. All the bankers in the room just let out a gasp. And it was because that day was the day that Bear Stearns was sold or basically went under. And I knew at that point we were probably not looking at an IPO. Um, and that's when the first one filed, and you can see what happened after that. Then we went back at it in 2010, and then the market got very soft again. And so we pulled back to the IPO idea. And again, timing here is uh, everything. The other issue with the IPOs that have happened is that it's required a lot of insider investment. Uh, over, if you look at the statistics, about over 50% of the money in IPO has actually been invested by the current investors. So again, this is not the kind of market that we've thought about IPOs being in the past. So at the end of uh, 11, uh, 2011, this was our situation. We were looking to raise about 20 to 25 million. We were wanted to use that money to complete two phase two studies. One was a ongoing 100 patient phase 2 study in ischemic stroke and then we had an FDA cleared 150 patient study in critical limb ischemia that was ready to go. Uh, we had two additional third party funded trials that were in process and our venture syndicate was very supportive of the company. Uh, we had uh, the only problem was that 
they were, did not have enough dry powder to write the whole check, and so they needed to get other investors involved. So we engaged a bank to raise the funds. We had a, a lot of relationship with banks through the IPO process, and we began a process that both was to raise money, but also as a parallel process. We went out to strategic investors um, and also strategic partners. And as part of that uh, conversations, and as it turns out that one of those conversations led to another conversation that led us to a company called Cytometics. And uh, the chairman of this company heard uh, seen a prospectus through that banker, and to be candid, we didn't know anything about Cybermetics before they called us up. Um, but this was a company that I think was kind of a stealth regenerative medicine company. Uh, if you kind of look at the transformation of the company, it, uh, they really had an intent on being in regenerative medicine. Their first product was uh, called a product called Autologel, which is a autologous uh, PRP or platelet-rich plasma gel that's used for chronic wounds. That was approved, I think, in 06, um, and it was is on the market. And then in 2010, they uh, acquired a product called the Angel Whole Blood Separation System, which is again a, a PRP system um, used um, now using the perfusion area first, and now being used in the orthopedic space a great deal. You can see here it's a product generating about seven million a year in revenue. And um, their view was we'd like to continue to build in the regenerative medicine space. So we had a lot of discussions with this company for over a couple week period and it became pretty clear I think what the rationale from both perspectives could be of why putting these companies together. From Cytomedic's perspective they had two commercial products, they didn't have really a deep pipeline of any other products and they could get through the acquisition that the deep pipeline that we have of proprietary cell therapies, get the manufacturing facility and all the R&D capabilities. And in fact, some of the products that uh, we had did fit with them, their products from a commercial uh, and therapeutic perspective. So the Autologel product I mentioned is for wound care. We had done a, uh, a uh, uh, trial with one of our products in critical ischemia where a lot of the amputations that occur in critical ischemia are caused because of uh, wounds that don't heal. And so that, that was a nice fit, and, and I'll talk about that um, in a little bit. And then from our perspective, um, you know, I think it was it was fairly obvious why it made sense. One was that this would, could be a vehicle for us to continue to get our clinical data. We, we want to make sure, our investors want to make sure that we got the data, because that's the validation of the value of our technology. Um, but also, as part of a public company, we also would have a pathway to liquidity. Not immediate liquidity, but uh, much greater chance of liquidity than if we'd stayed a, a private company. And it also mitigated their risk from an investor perspective because their, the Cytomedics products were commercial. They were generating revenue. There was, there, that was the floor of value. Um, so it, was, it, it made sense kind of at the, at the top level. Now, one of the other things that we've been through, we, we talked to a lot of companies, and, and uh, this is really important, and I, I can't stress this enough, but it was unique when we had the first couple of conversations that we actually shared a vision. We all believed in regenerative medicine, which you don't find a lot. This room is full of them, but outside this room, you don't find a lot of people who believe in regenerative med, so that was nice. Um, we actually both believe in autologous therapies. I know there's a lot of people who believe in off-the-shelf, and... That's wonderful, but there are values to autologous therapies, and we, we shared that. Um, the technologies that we have are actually similar in the sense that we separate out an active components of blood and bone marrow. They do it through a, uh, uh, through a device. We do it through a technology that we uh, incorporate into a product. And then um, the other point I think that's important is, you know, we, we both believe in creating value through differentiated products, um, doing the appropriate regulatory and reimbursement paths, and then rigorous clinical trials. You guys may say, well, how could that be possible? This is a PRP company, right? I mean, PRP, you know, a lot of data out in the field. Uh, some of it has been good, some bad. Uh, not a lot of rigor to those trials. Well, this is a company that's interesting because the device itself that they sell, the Autologel device creates a distinct formulation um, and it's a, it's, an, its own product. It's been approved, and we've just recently got reimbursement through uh, CMS for the product. But the Angel device actually produces, uh, is able to produce a very consistent concentration platelets and has the ability to change that concentration as well as change the hematocrit. So you can actually dial in specific products for specific indications. For instance, like OA, where you might want something that has 
fewer neutrophils in it and a higher concentration of platelets. So inherent in their technology was an ability to actually make discrete product characterizations, which is ultimately the, the strategy of how PRP is going to move forward with these very well-defined formulations per indication. So we moved fairly quickly um, from the time we met to the time we uh, had a term sheet in place. It was, I think, about two months, so it was fairly quick. And this is what the transaction looked like. I think it's unique in, in a lot of ways. It, it, it tries to balance, I think, the risks inherent here, as well as the possible upsides and returns for, for both shareholders. So the total transaction was 40 million, but it was paid in shares of Cytomedic stock priced at the day the deal closed, okay? Now 60% of that consideration is based on clinical milestones in our recover stroke, the phase two stroke study. Um, that include a safety milestone that we should hit this year, an enrollment milestone, which we should hit next year, and then the uh, clinical efficacy signal, which we'll also hit next year. So it's not a long time for our investors to wait for that payout if it works. But yet from a cytomedics perspective, they were able to say that this was a deal contingent on the value of the technology, i.e. if it didn't work, uh, they only paid the upfront fee and they still had the technology and the capabilities of the company. Now the other issue that we faced was, um, it's nice to get this, but how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to continue to you know, move these studies forward? And I think from a cytomedics investor perspective, they didn't want to see a, a great deal of dilution or a need for the company to go out in the markets and raise more money. So we actually raised $8 million along with the transaction, and $5 million of that came from Aldogen investors, which basically showed that they were committed to making this deal happen. They were committed to seeing the results of the trial, and the other three came from the warrant exercise by cytomedics key cytomedics uh, investors who also believed that this transaction made sense. Um, there are lockups on these shares, so this is not, again, a immediate liquidity um, type of deal for our shareholders, and they want to be in it. They want to see this go through, uh, so there's lockups from 6 to 18 months, which the 18th month lockout will get it to the end of the, end of the stroke data. And then also importantly, uh, three board seats went to Aldogen shareholders. So this again is not, uh, this is a, a combination of folks who were trying to, to make this work. So not only did we do the combination at the uh, board level, but I took over responsibility for operations of the entire company. So we've really, I think, merged uh, a view in terms of operational that uh, incorporates both perspectives. And so now what we do, we have a company that's focused, again, in regenerative medicine. Uh, the way we pitch it is that um, we now have, a, you know, maybe back to Dean's point, we have a solution for uh, autologous therapies that promote healing by harnessing two innate regenerative capabilities, either platelets or adult stem cells. And then this is what the pipeline now looks like. So we have two commercial products, uh, the autologel product, the angel product. Those products will, um, and we've, we've mentioned this publicly, they will, they will begin to generate cash, cash, positive cash flow at the beginning of next year, which should then pay for the development of these therapies. And that cash flow should only get larger with time uh, as, as those, those products grow. So we have the ALD-401 product, which is in the ischemic stroke uh, phase two. That's ongoing. Um, ALD-301 for uh, PAD, and that will be... Um, a, a, a program that we hope to uh, announce that it'll be a third-party funded study in PAD with that product uh, starting this year. And there's also an interest on our behalf to do uh, a combination of ALD-301 and Otologel where you can actually treat the wound but also improve perfusion underlying that wound so that the ultimate amputation rate of those patients we can reduce almost down into the five zero to five percent rate versus what we're seeing with just cell therapy alone, which might be up in the 20 percent range. And then uh, the other uh, product here is ALD-451. This was one of the third-party uh, trials that we, um, that I mentioned earlier. This is malignant glioma, so we're not using stem cells to treat the cancer. We're actually using stem cells to treat the neurocognitive deficits that occur from the treatment of those brain cancers. So there's radiation and surgery and stuff that happen. These patients have poor quality of life using stem cells to try to uh, improve that. And that's being funded at Duke University at their uh, brain tumor center, which is one of the best in the, in the country. So just a few of the lessons we learned in this process. Um, we kept 
as I mentioned, we had a number of other conversations with other, other firms, and we kept getting the question, does one plus one equal three? It's like, I think any investor asked that question. Uh, the shareholders obviously asked the question. It's not an easy uh, answer. Uh, we think in this case, one plus one equals three, but that was the one that we had to address first uh, and, and feel comfortable that we'd addressed it. Um, and I would say even if you've got that, it's not easy to make it happen. The, the issue of the shared vision, which I mentioned, the fact that the management fits and the uh, personalities, and then uh, importantly, the willingness to, uh, to reprioritize assets, particularly with limited cash resources is important. And in fact, Cytomedics had a preclinical uh, program that they've basically put on the, the back burner to make sure that our products go forward. And then the last point is just to be ready. We, we um, the fact that it happened quickly, I think had a lot to do with the fact that we had a lot of diligent stocks in place through the uh, IPO process. They were able to go right into a data room. It was all set up. It had all the documentation. And I think that's not just true of this kind of transaction, but even a fundraise where you, you know, you can accelerate it by making sure that those, all of that is prepared and ready to go. So uh, with that, I'll wrap it up and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, uh, so I would encourage everybody to actually um, question now about the financing issue because uh, Ed's talk is wrapping up the morning session around financing and uh, the capital side of this. So I'm sure Ed is a very happy to answer lots of questions. Okay. Uh, unless uh, I can get that started. Um, so to me, it looks like it was. You know, you have one plus one, like three. So it was, a, in some ways, you know, a match made on somewhere. Um, do you think that is a lucky coincidence that there was such a great match, not shared vision, management fit, all that? But um, you know, in, in other words, are there others out there that you could see that would have been a fit for Aldogen? Um yeah, I mean, I think there were others out there. I mean, um, without name, names, there there were other. There were definitely other fits. Um, I, you know, you look back. I think this one, this one, has a lot of the, as I mentioned, a lot of the positive characteristics that we'd be looking for. Um, but again, I think in general, this is where this space needs to go. There, there are too many smaller companies. There's probably too many smaller public companies. Uh, I think ultimately, getting some critical mass uh, and trying to build a real business, I think, needs to happen. And and um, I think that you'll see more of this, hopefully. And do you think, in retrospect now, would there have been a benefit of going IPO instead of Cytomatics? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously, Cytomatics, from your presentation, is a very good fit all around. Right. Like. So, as I said, I, to me, that looks like a lucky coincidence. I, and it will work out, I'm pretty sure about that. But if you're in the same situation where you're at this point where you could go for an IPO or for a partner like this, that this may not be such a good fit. You know, is the IPO still something that you would say people should consider or? Well, I think it's definitely worth considering. I mean, there's an enormous cost and time associated with it. And like I said, it's a financing event. It's not a liquidity event. Um, it. The, but the the public markets for cell therapy, Regen Med stocks is not very um, friendly from a valuation perspective. So you can get public and you're going to have a, a diminished valuation, and but you'll be able to raise money if you need it to go forward. I mean, it, if we'd have done uh, an IPO in 08, I would been that would have been a problem because um, yeah. of what happened for a couple of years in the market. I think 10, 2010 would have been okay. You know, um, but there, from our investor perspective, they're completely would have been dependent on what happened with our trials, and with no revenue generation, different story. I think in some ways this story is better long term, um, and I think it'll play more to investors when you talk about a cash flow business that can support development. Uh, I think that's a nice story. Any question? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You need, um, he's he controlling it, right? I, no, he's not. Microphone wins. <laughs> um, I mean, it was, it's, a, it's a very nice story to go in that far along the path with six INDs. Um, you know, most 
biotech companies, you know, recombinant proteins and, and antibodies and stuff don't get that far before they're before they're um, acquired. Or the, the event happens. Can you guess or compare the value of an IND in regenerative medicine or cell therapy versus an IND for a recombinant antibody or a protein? It's worth a lot less. Why? How's that? <laughs> It, it's, I, I mean, you know, I, I've said this long. The, the problem in our space is that the clinical data doesn't exist to suggest that these products work. I mean, you know, let's, I mean, we can't other than the ones that are on the market and working. I mean, there's just limited clinical data. And so the partners haven't really stepped up a great deal because of that, I think. Uh, just the fact that you can get into trials and do a phase one or even a small phase two that is mainly for safety doesn't get people over the hurdle. Um, where that is a significant value inflection point, in my opinion. Uh, and I, we, we've had thousands of conversations with potential pharmaceutical big biotech partners that have confirmed that. Um, but if you have a small molecule or a, a protein that they can look at and go, that reminds me of X and I get it, I know how to make it, I know the business model. I mean, it's much easier. And IND or if even safety data in humans is worth a heck of a lot more. Um, it's just where we are as a, as a field. Now, that may change. I mean, if we can get two or three good phase two or phase three readouts and people will go, well, okay, these things are working, then that may change. But it's, it's, not, it's not that way now. Yeah. Um, a slightly different version of Nook's question. Um, as you look, sort of, you know, dial the clock back and think back, you know, to where you Capital markets aside, think about you know, your IPO versus sort of strategic acquisition choice. Yeah. Uh, what would you, and, and as you look at, uh, say, give advice to others who are you know, potentially in that position at some point, what would you have had to do differently in either situation in terms of either what you had to have in the company as assets or be focused on operationally or packaging the story if you go down the IPO path versus, say, the being acquired path? Well, like I said, I think the acquired path is, is what I don't think was an option in 08. I don't think it was an option in 2010. I just don't think the, the, the data was there or matured enough that would have driven a strategic deal, you know, either phase two data or phase one, two data. I just don't think it would, it would have driven it. Um, the, the one thing I would say, and w one of the things we faced, we had a number of, so we got caught up in the, this, what George talked about. We had a couple of VCs that were big funds. Uh, Tullis Dickerson, I'll name as one, who had, I don't know, I think close to a billion dollars invested in the life science space. We were in their last fund. Uh, unfortunately, they decided not to raise another fund. And so they could not support the ongoing issues, right, and keep the price up and, and drive. And, and if we needed to do come up with half of the IPO, they couldn't do that. So I think really the choice, and George mentioned earlier, the choice of syndicate here is really important. You want funds that are early. You want funds that have track records that uh, who have a lot of money. Um, we, we had a syndicate that had two or three with a lot of money, and, and one fell out due to that issue, and then a few others that weren't as, weren't as robust. So I think choice of that syndicate is really important because that gives you freedom. You know, either to say no to a, to a strategic deal or to say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force the IPO because I can do 50% of it, but that gets in public and puts me on that path. I think that's part of it. Um, but as George alluded to earlier, there's not a lot of those funds out there looking at Regen Med, but if you can get them, those, those are the ones you want. Great. Uh, any other questions? All right, then. Thanks again, Nat. Thanks. Very nice.